keep going. Keep going. Keep More. going. A little bit. I don't think the tide's very high. No. You got it? Yep. Beautiful morning, isn't it? Yeah. Growing up in Noosa, there's the river and there's the ocean and there's the estuary and there's the lakes. We're literally surrounded by beautiful waterways. Being out on the river really early in the morning provides this really unique experience. All the wildlife comes out and you get to actually see it before the river gets really busy. And you really get a sense that you're just alone in this beautiful place. What drew me really to the water was just the amount that we don't know that's under there and the amount of research that can go on without us even really knowing. The water is the lifeblood of the ecosystem. I think it's often underestimated. There was a while where there was um, some massive bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef and having been there multiple times with my family and, you know, loved it, I found that really disheartening and just made me really, really sad for like a long period of time. I was just, you know, it was all I could think about and you just keep mulling over and being like, well, I can't do anything. It's coral ages away from me. When it came to choosing subjects in year 10 and marine science was offered as an option, and I saw it on the paper and I was like, wow, that is something that I can do. This year at school, it's been really exciting because we've got to really work hands-on with a project, conserving something in our local environment, which is bringing back oysters from the brink of extinction in the Noosa River. Today we're going to be talking about oysters and in particular the restoration of the oysters in the Noosa River system. We'll start by just discussing what is a reef. So we're aware from our work with Aboriginal elders that the Noosa River system contained vast oyster reefs. They were a staple diet of the Cubby Cubby people to the extent where the shell middens in this Tawantan region were kilometres long and stories high. Post-colonisation, there was a realisation of the lime content in these oyster shells, and they were used to actually make road base, and the remaining oyster reefs in the river system were mined for that use. With loss of probably 90% of the oysters throughout the river systems in Australia, that's been a huge loss of the things that clean the rivers. And as a consequence, most of the rivers we, we see are, are brown, and they should be clear. The marine science curriculum that we developed involves the students actually participating through a wonderful community engagement project called the Oyster Gardening Project, which has allowed students to actually become involved in the monitoring and the growth of those spats that will then help support the reef system. There's like little ones and they just look like dots on it, but they're a bit hard to see. He's not very happy. <laughs> The oysters actually not only benefit the river from a really practical, direct way through filtering the water and providing a habitat for key species, but also they're part of a much bigger restoration of the river. They're like coral. They set up a reef. It's got places for fish to hide, animals to live in. They build an ecosystem. I've really enjoyed getting hands-on with the oyster gardening at school. I asked if I could learn more and I've been invited with some friends to visit the hatchery where they're spawning baby oysters to help repopulate the reef. Welcome to the Bridey Island Oyster Research. <laughs> so this is where it starts. These are the, the broodstock oysters that we collected from the Noosa River. So how do you replicate the spawning of the oysters in this sort of lab condition compared to one in like a natural ecosystem? In this tank, we just manipulate the temperature and the salinity. Then when the temperature comes up to about 30 degrees, then we introduce uh, 
bucket full of fresh water, which is just like a thunderstorm coming through. That's a cue for the oysters to spawn. There'll be plenty of food for the larvae. Okay, so after the oysters have spawned, uh, and then we hatch the larvae out. And as the larvae drift past the torch, you can just see the little tiny specks. The larvae is the mobile stage of its life cycle. They can swim and they can crawl. In a couple of days' time, this larvae will find, in this case, a piece of shell to attach to, and it will literally cement itself to the shell and it'll never, never move from that location. At the moment in this tank, we've got all this oyster shell. Uh, oyster shell was collected up from Noosa, from different restaurants, and um, has been dried and conditioned and uh, and the larvae are ready to go, we add them into the tanks and we let them settle naturally. What's the success rate of like these oysters settling and growing correctly compared to that of them in the wild? So in here we try to get about uh, 10 oyster spat per shell. In the wild, they people have done little spat collection trials, I think one or two per shell is probably the max oh, they get. Wow. So it's a, a big difference. So most of the times when you think of an oyster, you think of a single seed, single oyster by itself in a restaurant. But this is how an oyster looks like in the wild. A whole group of different oysters all attached onto each other in a little clump. Oysters quite actively are attracted to other oyster shells. So they know one oyster settled in a good location, another oyster comes settled onto them, and then layer upon layer upon layer of oysters settle, and that makes the building blocks of the oyster reef. Yeah, the bike in Brisbane builds them, they make up. Just mind your shins on the uh, oysters a little bit sharp. We've probably got, you know, in excess of 100,000 baby oysters there, waiting to go into their new forever home. Today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking the juvenile oysters that are coming here from the hatchery, and we're going to be taking them out to the reef. Today we're putting the oysters in, but from then on it's up to them. Oh, the fish in there. I'm much slower at it than the professionals. <laughs> Nature itself has a tendency to want to bounce back and to be resilient in the face of these challenges. So we need to look more towards these type of nature-based solutions to try and resolve some of the environmental challenges that we're facing. It's such a fulfilling experience to be able to give something back to a river that gave me everything. And I know a lot of young people like me are also really nervous about the future because of climate change or ecosystem deterioration. Like, it's a real cause of anxiety. Getting involved and getting out today in the sun and holding the oysters in my hands and putting them down knowing that they were going to make a difference, it just eases the anxiety so much because you know that you're being part of something. Next year I'll be moving to Tasmania and studying marine and Antarctic science at the University of Tasmania. I've got no support system down there, I've got no one that I know. I'm leaving that all behind here. but. I just know that in that community and there's volunteer projects that I can totally get my hands in. That's going to be such a great way for me to establish myself. I mean, there's so much work that's been put into these oysters, so it's so exciting to see them actually starting to be put into their forever homes. And hopefully when we see the results and come back with everything after a few months, it's going to be amazing and we'll have a look and this is where it starts and we'll see uh, an amazing final product with all of these starting to recruit and make you know make these their home and start doing all the good things that they're going to do for the river.